Um, so today I would like to talk about, uh, uh, again, a TLDF OLED, but more an experimental study combined with simulations. And uh, the talk is Device Performance and Degradation Analysis of a Sky Blue TRDF OLED. Uh, this was done in the framework of a European project, Mostofos. And uh, partners were yeah, Sinora, who provided the emitter, the TRDF emitter, Theo Dresden, who fabricated the device, uh, Fluxim and, and ZHW, who helped with modeling and uh, did the measurements. So um, it's actually split in a bit of two parts. So first, I would like to uh, talk about uh, device properties at state zero, let's say. So I will look at uh, the emitter orientation and the emitter distribution, also compare it with uh, sensing layer experiments. And in a second um, part, I will talk about the degradation that we analyzed with uh, PIOS. So um, very briefly about the emitter orientation. So this was uh, the first step. Uh, we did uh, fl fluorescence measurements with this new uh, device, Philos. And uh, when you em uh, simulate this angular dependent radiance with an electro-optical simulation tool like ZFOS, you can get out uh, emitter orientation. So this is uh, what what you get out here. So here uh, you get a certain distribution of uh, um, emitter orientation in horizontal and vertical um, orientation. And I will not talk about the details because on Thursday there will be a talk by my colleague Baltzar who will uh, actually introduce the technique in more details. So I will just show you the results. So this is the measured p-polarized and s-polarized emission of such a TRDF film. And then we modeled it um, so it's just a film on glass, which simply model this simple device. And what you, what you see is that the fit very nicely reproduces the measurement. And then you can get something like a dipole orientation. So as a reference, zero would be completely horizontal dipole orientation, and one would be completely vertical dipole orientation. And here, uh, Theo Dresden fabricated some devices with different hosts and also different uh, emitter concentrations, so 20% would correspond to the <laughs> OLED. And yeah, it's not that interesting, actually. <laughs> it's more or less random for this MCB pro B C MCBP, uh, sorry, MCP host, sorry. <laughs> and a bit more vertical for the MCBP host, which is actually used in the OLED afterwards. And if you look at this um, 0.37 orientation, and you do some, or you vary this parameter and do some mode analysis, you can actually get the fraction of outcoupled light. And you see that for this device, you get approximately 18%. So there is some roof room for improvement already if you could tune this emitter orientation a bit more. Um, but this was just a well, very simple st study in the first place. Um, and the next thing would be to look at the full OLED and look at the emission zone. And uh, this is how it works. So you give in uh, the stack definition. See, here are all the layers. Um, then you also feed in the, the target. So this is the angular emission spectrum in S and P polarization. Um, actually, this is just S polarization. Then you need to also know the NK data and the emitter spectrum. So this I took from the previous PL measurements. And then you, you check, you simulate, and, you, and internally there is a fitting algorithm uh, described in this paper, which compares the target, so your measured data with the simulation, and then gives you out something like a emitter distribution. And uh, yes, this is basically your result. So here you would see uh, an emission that is more closely to the cathode. Um, this is what I did uh, with with fellows, but first, uh, just to show you the experimental data. So um, again, we measured angular emission, and here I just show you six angles, and I measured always at three different current values, so 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1 milliamp. Um, this corresponds to uh, 1.5 milliamps per square centimeter, just a reference. And what you can see already, uh, from the experiment is that you have here 
no contribution from anything else, and here it grows with increasing current density. And what they believe is that it's due to some emission from actually the HDL layer. So I did not really manage to model this proper, properly, um, because, yeah, it's more complicated. You need to assume some emission from the HDL and also fit this. Uh, it's work in progress, maybe I achieve it. But for the moment, I just fit until the wavelength range of 450 for simplicity. So these are uh, the best fits I got. Above, you see the simulation, or the experiment, and here you see the simulation. And it agrees already pretty well, uh, although there are some well, could be there is room for improvement. For example, 45 degrees, the peak is too, f too sh uh, small compared to the experiment, and so on. So, but uh, it works already quite nicely. So, uh, yeah. One thing I forgot to mention here, actually, uh, we also used the approach that Marcus described. So we used a, a large ETL thickness, such that we get the detuned all it, and that's why also why you have this large shift in spectral uh, emission as a function of angle. So here you can see um, when I overlap them, you see that there is room for improvement, but still it works quite nicely. The radiance fits actually well, fairly well uh, for all the three different uh, current densities. And now the interesting thing is how does the emission emitter distribution look like? Uh, this is what we got. So at 0 0.1 milliamps, I get a fairly broad emission still concentrated mostly at NB-FEN uh, interface, and then I get some kind of split emission zone, but predominantly at the NB-FEN interface still. Um, now, Theo Dresden also fabricated some sensing layer devices, so they just put in the first 5 nanometer of this TCTA, or in the first 5 nanometer of the NB-FEN, they put some sensitizer, iridium complex, and this is this peak here. And um, what you can see here is that, so here is the emitter, the sensor in the TCTA, and you can still see a signal, and it actually decreases with increasing current density. And this is what you can see here. So with uh, increasing current density, you get more emission from this side. And on the other hand, if they put the sensor in the NB fan layer, they get an increase in uh, signal from this sensitizer, and this is also what we qualitatively see here, so we get an increase at this interface. So it's our fitting is in very nice agreement with the sensing layer approach, and it looks promising to, well, calculate with these quantitative um, results like efficiency and outcoupling. Okay, in a second step, um, we looked at the degradation because most of us was actually about, well, enhancing the lifetime of, of blue OLEDs. So we had to understand what is going on during degradation. And this is just uh, well, uh, a, a stack that is used for, for yeah, distributing and work. So it's not their best emitter. They, have, they told us it's uh, well, their workhorse. They have lifetimes of 11 hours, LT80. And what we got uh, while stressing is uh, 8.2 hours, so it's in very nice agreement. And uh, what you can see here actually is, so this is the, the luminance, and at these uh, lines we did some interruption of the stress, and we did a lot of uh, device measurements, so IVL, spectral intensity, CV, CF, transient EL, and dark and injection C leaf measurements, and even more. Um, and then we analyze this as a function of stress time and hope to understand what is going on in the device. So uh, for degradation, there is a lot of hypotheses. Um, I will not go into detail now, but um, um, these are just a few hypotheses that I will follow in the following uh, analysis. So these are selections of graphs um, as a function of stress time, so zero stress time to 15 hours stress time, and we do not only measure steady state performance here, so IV uh, luminance and spectral density, but we also have impedance data and transient data. And as you will see, it's very important to have all these kinds or a lot of different measurements and not only the steady state um, 
analysis. Um, as a first thing, we just look at this, well, a simple device hypothesis or failure mechanism, which would be external contact modification. So if uh, series resistance would increase, you would directly see something in this decay of the CF behavior or also uh, in the rise of the dark sea leaf. Uh, so we can also already exclude this external contact modification to be a reason for our f uh, degradation. Uh, also, formation of parasitic current pathways, which would incre or, uh, yeah, increase the shunt, so uh, decrease the parallel resistance. We would see it in, in this kind of measurement. We would see an increase here in the reverse uh, IV curve or, or also in the rise, sometimes in the dark sea leaf. So we can already exclude um, this to be the reason for our degradation. Um, as a next step, what is quite often reported is the uh, formation of exciton quenching sites, so uh, um, leading to higher TPQ or uh, yeah, these kind of um, uh, processes. And what we did here is, uh, or what you can see here, is t TL decays. And this de first decay that we see is actually related to the delayed part of the... Um, TADF mechanism, and you can simply uh, perform an exponential fit here, and what you get is a lifetime, and this is more or less five microseconds over the whole degradation time, and um, well, actually, these five microseconds agree very well with the fluorescence data, so this is a, a first hint uh, that it's correct, and the second more important thing here for our degradation analysis is the fact that it doesn't change. Why? Um, this degradation, or this, no, this lifetime of the delayed part can be um, well written with rates, and uh, if you would see, or if, if such an exciton quenching site would appear, you would see a change in this non-relative decay rates, either in the triplet or in the singlet, and if this would change, you would also expect a change in the lifetime. And since we do not observe such a change, we can um, exclude already kind of a change of this non-radiative uh, decay rates being enhanced during degradation. So this yeah, can also be modeled. So here I just vary this decay rate and you see that there is a direct influence. Um, as a next step, um, we do see some change in the TEL onset and also in the injection sea leaf overshoot. And if you would just apply some formulas uh, which just relate the onset with the mobility or here the peak time with the mobility, you see that the apparent mobility is decreasing with degradation time. And uh, this, this mobility can also be assigned um, to, to the holes, actually. So this, I will not show you the details, but we had a lot of devices with varied ETL and HDL material thickness, and uh, you can use some uh, formula and you find that it must be uh, determined by the whole mobility this onset. Um, however, since we have a lot of layers here, we cannot assign already um, which layer would is degrading and causing this effect. So uh, we had to use simulations, and before we can analyze the parameters, we had to use some base, or we had to simulate the base case. Um, yes, this is work in progress, so it's not yet a perfect fit, but you can already see that it reproduces the, 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 the most important uh, features. So you have the peak at the right position, and you have the TL onset, yes. <laughs> um, so um, then we just vary these parameters, so I will speed up uh, due to the lack of time. We have injection barriers and NPB mobility variation that would lead to the same effect as we see experimentally. Um, a TCTA, whole mobility, and EML, we can more or less exclude. And however, we can with this, we cannot ex uh, explain the change in effic or device efficiency. Uh, so the last point to mention is that we could also have some formation of non additive recombination centers. Uh, it's still work in progress, so we, we do not see a, a change in this 
CF plot, but it could also be due to the fact that we have a lot of different layers, so this is still a work in progress. Um, yes, and I will leave out this conclusion due to the lack of time and um, would like to thank all the people that contributed and you for your attention. Maybe for us, most obvious would be that the emitter is destroyed. So how would it look like if the emitter is destroyed? Because you looked a lot of full mobilities, but you looked at yes. every layer. Um, well, I would... I try to, to mimic it by, uh, at the moment, just by introducing traps. And I didn't see any um, change in the simulation, so uh, I still have to find a, a parameter that would represent this, this effect that you would see in the simulation and so also in the, in the uh, experiment. Maybe you can just lower the concentration? Because yes, if the emitter breaks, I mean it's maybe it's not necessarily a trap. The problem <laughs> is that, or yeah, we, we model it uh, just with one transport layer, so we don't model the EML with two, th mm. the host and the guest. So if we lower the concentration, we would effectively lower all the all the molecules, kind of, uh. how we cannot select. That's why I started with traps. But um, yes, it would definitely be an idea to lower also the concentration. 